Shalom, everybody. It is good to be together. Hine matov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad. Hine matov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad. Hine matov umanaim shevet Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Welcome all of you here on our Bel Air campus and to all of you who are joining from home. We are so grateful that you have chosen to make Stephen Wise Temple part of your Shabbat practice. We're so glad to be here. It was a beautiful day, a little bit warm. warm. It's starting to cool down and it's nice and cool inside. And we're joined by our cantorial intern, Josh Goldberg and Jeff Stern and David Cohen. Rabbi Wesnik is here with us and we're gonna hear later from our special guest, Dr. Andrew Rayfeld, president of the Hebrew Union College, and we couldn't be happier to have you here. Ordination of the rabbinic class in Los Angeles is on Sunday, so we're very excited for that moment as well. We're going to continue with our candle lighting blessing, which can be found on page two. I want to invite you joining from home to go ahead and light your candles right along with us. Shanu be mitzvotav, vetsivanu lehad likner, lehad likner shel shabbat. We're going to continue on page twelve. Lechun eranena. It's a psalm that invites us to sing out to God with joy and with gladness. And with excitement, because there's, so, thank you so much, Josh, uh, because there's so much to be happy about, especially when Shabbat comes. L'chun eranana.
joy? Oh, yes. I am feeling I am joy. Definitely. L'cha Dodi <laughs> can be found on page 20. And this is romance. I mean, what we just experienced with Psalm 95 is the joy of Shabbat. But here's kind of the love of Shabbat because L'cha Dodi reminds us that there is a beautiful relationship that leads to this gift of rest between Shabbat and the Jewish people and God. We give thanks for the gift of this day. Lachado D, page 20. Baruch Hu, our call to worship on page 28. Yai la lai 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 
my teacher to the Bima, Dr. Andrew Rehfeld, and before he became president of the Hebrew Union College, and you're going to hear from him a little bit later, he was my teacher at Kutz Camp. He taught me how to be a song leader. And Dr. Rehfeld, it's great to have you here with us. And when I said, would you please, would you mind playing the guitar and maybe joining, I had to twist your arm for about two seconds. And then you said, I'm in. Might have been three. Thank you. Ahavat olam. A prayer giving thanks to God for the gift of learning, for the gift of Torah. You can find it, you can find it on page 32. Ahavatulam Et Yisrael Am ha 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 ta Am ha 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 ta Torah meets both Who keep mishpati O ta O Tanu Limadata Al Kain Adonai Eloheinu Bishoch Benu Umenu Nasiach Bechukecha Benismach Bedibrei Toratecha
Do you ever get a little boost bumpy when you're about to recite the Shema? If there's one page that probably doesn't need to be announced in services, it's the page that contains the Shema. That's because almost everybody knows it by heart. The cantor just simply begins, Shema, and then we all collectively go, Yisrael, and we sing it together. And even many Jews who have scant knowledge of Hebrew know the Shema, and they usually know the translation, Hero Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. The Shema, a lot of people don't know this, is a verse taken from the Torah, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And we know the verses that follow. You know them by heart too, probably. You shall love the Lord your God, Adonai your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Yet what is not as well known is the verse that precedes the Shema in Deuteronomy. The Shamata Yisrael, the Shamarta la'asot asher yitav lecha. Obey Israel willingly and faithfully, that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, live by the mitzvot, the commandment, and things will go well for you as a people. God is sharing what God wants from us. And in the very next verse, the Torah records the Shema, and we chant it as a statement of faith. We often ask God for things, to protect us, to heal those who are ill, to give us prosperity. We ask God to take care of our loved ones. We ask God for peace, for a long and good life. And I think those are all good things to ask God for. And yet, I want to suggest that as important as it is to request what we want from God, there is, I believe, an even more important question, what God wants from me. Far more important than what I want from God is what God wants from me. So the words and melody of the Shema, I hope they touch you in some way. I think of you, I think you should feel it as a moment of connection. We are stating our unequivocal faith in God and throughout the service we make many requests of God. And God perhaps is replying, reminding us of what God wants from us. Perhaps that's the conversation that it can times can send those little goosebumps up and down our spine. And even though you don't need to know it, the Shema is on page 34. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad 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 Aruch Shem Kevod Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'er Aruch Shem Kevod Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'er Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai
continue with our Song of Redemption, the Micha Mocha on page 40. Yaakov, who get a low yard, Hazak me men who Paru Hata Adonai Gal Israel. thinking a lot about the juxtaposition between Micha Mocha and Hashkivenu because in the morning service we have these three prayers surrounding Shema, a prayer for creation, a prayer for revelation, and then a prayer for redemption. But in the evening service you add Hashkivenu and I've been thinking about it in context of this period of the Omer where we're counting up to Sinai from Passover to Shavuot seven weeks. Micha Mocha is the prayer of Passover, our prayer of redemption, and Hashkivenu talks about the Sukkot Shalom, the Sukkah of peace that we want spread over ourselves and our world. All Israel, all humanity should know that sense of wholeness that comes with that sense of being under God's Sukkah. And that relates to Shavuot because our tradition teaches that our ancestors, when we were wandering in the wilderness, we dwelled in those Sukkot. And maybe that was a bit of a promise of the reward of redemption. We will go free and we will have a sense of shalom. So we'll continue with Hashkivenu on page 42. Hashkivenu Adonai Eloheinu shalom Shomerenu, Shomerenu, Lechayim, Hashkivenu, Adonai, Eloheinu, Shalom, Ve'amidenu. Oh, so 
Nazareno, so kann ich am Prayer for healing, Misha Berach, is an opportunity for us to pray for others, people we know, and more broadly, people we know who are suffering, but also a reminder not to take our own health for granted and to treasure each day and each breath and to do our best to take care of ourselves and others so that we can enjoy the life that God has given us. Misha Berach, Le Rifua, a prayer for healing. Shabbat Avotenu ve'imotenu Abraham Yitzchak ve'yakov Sara Rivka Rachel ve'leya Yivarech et ha'cholim Shabbat Avotenu ve imotenu, Avraham Yitzchak ve Yaakov, Sara Rivka, Rachel ve Leia, Yivarei Cher Hacholim, Hakadosh Abraham Yitzchak ve Yaakov Sara Rivka Rachel ve Leia Hu Yivarech et HaCholim Refuat HaNefesh Hu Refuat Venom 
central prayer of our service is called Hatfilah. It's also known as the Amidah, right? Comes from the word to stand. And I've often thought about why that's such a powerful prayer, because I'm reminded who we are standing before and what a privilege it is to be able to stand before God, to share our hopes, our dreams, our memories, to thank God for our ancestors and to pray for all the things we hope for in the future. So I'll ask you to rise, to remember, remember for whom we stand before. If you chant the Amida, pages 46 through 62, and when your prayers are completed, please be seated.
thank you so much. Thanks, Hava. Thank you for being with us, and thank you, Josh. It's an honor to be able to invite to the Bima Dr. Andrew Rayfeld. I mentioned him earlier in the service in the context of his very important work as uh, my teacher at Kutz Camp in 1985. Um, and later, if you're really, really nice, I'll show you a photo of the two of us. Back then, it's pretty adorable. In addition to that, actually, Dr. Rayfeld went on to an incredible career. That was not the high point. Um, although, you know, musically, emotionally, maybe, but then Dr. Rayfeld went on and after spending some time in India and doing all sorts of things in the Jewish community, very active in Nifty uh, and, uh, and Jewish youth groups, also camping, Olin Sang Ruby, Dr. Rayfeld pursued a PhD in politics. He was a faculty member at Washington University in St. Louis for many years and also ran the Federation. And while you were running the Federation, you were also doing some teaching. And then uh, he became the 10th president of the Hebrew Union College just a few years back, right in time for COVID. So you timed it perfectly. Uh, but we're really, really pleased that you're here for ordination. And we're grateful for the partnership that we have with the Hebrew Union College. As many of you might know, Rabbi Isaiah Zeldin, our founding rabbi, the creator and the visionary of Stephen Weiss Temple was also the first dean of the Los Angeles campus of Hebrew Union College and was devoted to the College Institute. And we always have to say College Institute here because Stephen Samuel Wise, our namesake, was the founder of the Jewish Institute of Religion. Uh, and that was, he was the man who inspired Rabbi Zeldin. So uh, Dr. Rayfeld, thank you so much, Andrew, for being here with us. Please, the Bima is yours. Rabbi uh, Yoshi, thank you. I want to say it was so long ago that, believe it or not, I had hair, and it was so long ago Yoshi did not. <laughs> Just made that up. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really, really delighted to be with you in person and virtually. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, The Future of American Judaism. Uh, and uh, I want to just say the future, when I look at the clergy team here, I look at the vibrancy of the synagogue, look at the partnership that Stephen Wise has had with HUC, it makes me feel very optimistic and very uh, excited. Uh, uh, I, I want to recognize uh, my, uh, my chief of staff who's here, Jessica Silver, and Matt Lockheim, who's here, who's also a member of our board. Uh, it's a great partnership that we have, and I'm grateful for you for that support. Um, I want to say that the future of American Judaism depends in no small part on the leadership of our American Jewish communities. As exhibited here, any great community is great not only because of the people, but because of the leaders that can coalesce it. And here I want to start with a note of concern uh, that the, the, ten, the tendency and the trends in American Judaism are declining, uh, less membership, less engagement, et cetera. And given that backdrop, I'm so excited to share with you that we are uh, about to launch 16 new rabbinical students off to train for a great new uh, Year in Israel program. Rabbi Zweibeck ran that program for a few years, a number of years ago before coming here. We're just so excited for that new class. And as excited as we are for those 16 new students, the 15 new students that are coming, the concern is reflected in leadership too, because just 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we were having 40, 50, 60, even 70 students start. And again, the numbers coming in this year are a low of 15. Now that sounds bad. You could say, uh-oh, HUC is really in the decline. We remain the largest seminary. All of the traditional seminaries are seeing the same kind of decline. So the question that, that we have to ask in terms of the future, what are we doing about it? And in order to ask what are we doing about it, we have to ask what are the causes of it? And I bet if I asked you what are the causes of it, let me ask you, anyone here in the audience have an idea? What, what might be the causes? Why aren't so many people going? Anything strike to you? Yes, I, say that again? Intermarriage. intermarriage. What about intermarriage? So 
So thank you. So the, the response for those on Zoom is that uh, intermarriage, the concern is from uh, the congregation, from the kahal, that it pulls both partners away from Judaism, and that is one trajectory of intermarriage. But there's another story of intermarriage that it actually is pulling people in, and we're seeing a lot of that. So, so that's a good hypothesis, and it's unclear uh, what the effect is, except that it looks like it's a great avenue for inclusion as well as it might be an off-ramp. So it's good that you're saying that. An uh, another uh, possibility for the decline? Any other thoughts about this? Let me, let me give you some usual suspects that we hear. Number one, declining membership. If they're declining membership in congregations, there's going to be declining numbers of people ready to take the step to become a rabbi, to become a cantor. When I was uh, uh, confirmed in 1982 in Baltimore Hebrew Congregation, there were 60 or 70 of us in the confirmation class. I think last year, Baltimore Hebrew Congregation, which is still one of the largest, maybe the largest congregation in Baltimore, I think it had 15 students in their confirmation class. So if you have fewer students coming up through the ranks, you're gonna have fewer that are going to make the choice to be uh, rabbis. Here's another one, increased secularization. More and more of our community, particularly under the age of the 30, does not think of themselves as religiously Jewish. They talk of themselves as just Jewish. And if it's more secular, what kind of secular Jew is going to become a rabbi? And in fact, even as we have 15 new rabbinical students, this year for the first year ever, and uh, with the Zeldin family in mind, the Z School, the Zelico School of Jewish Nonprofit Management, will enroll more students than our rabbinical school. They will come in at 16 students. Matt, that's news to you. We, I just found that out from Adam today. So we're seeing a shift. Uh, secular does not mean uh, not necessarily a belief in, uh, in the spirit or, or God, but it is uh, a distancing from it. People still looking for meaning and purpose. And finally, as your team can attest to, these jobs that we are trying to build capacity and build strength in are really hard, and they've just gotten more difficult. I bet you didn't know you would have to be a production expert and uh, no tech. Uh, you have to be a pastor. You have to be a social justice activist or uh, a supporter. You have to be a scholar, a teacher. You have to be somebody that can run an organization. So how do you do this job? All of those are challenges. Now those are the easy uh, answers. Those are the easy causes. But I like to look for indirect causes, not the ones that are obvious. I'm reminded in 1840, who doesn't think of 1840 when you think of things to reference. Uh, a Hungarian physician, uh, Semmelweis was his name, he had a problem that he was trying to solve for that a whole, uh, a whole units of, of his uh, in the hospital were dying of, of childbed fever. And he looked at all the obvious uh, explanations, epidemic and overcrowding diet or rough treatment by the doctors examining the, the women, and none of them could explain the difference. The only thing that he saw was that in this ward, the death rate was very much higher than in this war. That was the only difference. And so he started to look at, well, what were the doctors doing? And the doctors examining this ward were coming from surgery directly. The doctors examining this ward and the other ward were not coming from surgery. They were coming uh, as, as the first uh, group of patients to examine. And he said, wait a second, maybe there's something that's happening in surgery or what we would say not happening after surgery. They weren't washing their hands. And it was, who would have thought you were looking at different things? It's the four, it's how we got to antisepsis today and a theory of, of microbes as what infects people. And so it's the idea that we are, often we don't think of the indirect. So what are some of the indirect possibilities? So I wanna just mention three before wrapping up and talking about our future because we have to solve this problem. Number one, I think we have to look at what the average age is, or we have to think about uh, the dynamics of the times that people are being raged. Average age of rabbinical students is around 26 or so, and if they're 26 and we see the decline in the rabbinical students coming into our program happening around 20, uh, 2006, you go back 26 years, you're at the year 1980, what's happening in 1980 that affected their childhood? And it's really, if you look politically, which is how I think, uh, is, uh, is the Reagan Revolution and a real shift in a number of things in the United States. Number one, Reagan and followed by Bush and Clinton, the economics of it, fueled unprecedented levels of inequality, unprecedented in our lifetime. And as inequality expands, the difference between going into service professions versus going into 
e economically more lucrative professions grows and grows and grows. And so it becomes less and less financially sustainable to do this, and you're thinking, well, maybe not. That's number one. Number two, there's an enmeshment that happens with uh, the Reagan's generation of politics and religion, particularly politics on the right, where um, religious fundamentalists, of course, get involved in the politics of the right, uh, of, of right politics. And what that means for particularly reformed Jews, who just descriptively, with whatever your politics are, whatever mine are, whatever the, uh, leaving that aside, descriptively, reformed Jews tend to be on the more liberal side. And if you see a uh, religion being associated with a politics you don't like, you are less likely to be engaged with that. Uh, because political identity is much more robust over time than religious identity. It's just a way of saying, if you were born a Democrat or Republican, you're likely going to be a Democrat or Republican when you get to the end of your life. But our uh, religious engagement ebbs and flows. So those are two, these are all hypotheses that we need to start investigating. Number two, there is something about technology. Jonathan Haidt in a recent uh, Atlantic article uh, entitled, Why the Past 10 Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. It's a great title for a great article. But he notes the following, in 2010, something went terribly wrong. In 2010 is right about the time that we see admissions declining significantly. We are disoriented, unable to speak the same language or recognize the same truth. We are cut off from one another and from the past. And what happened? Social media has weakened social capital institutions and shared stories. What happens around this time? 2007, the iPhone. 2008, Facebook and social media. We are becoming so internalized that we're not thinking about community. And when we're not thinking about community, we don't think of leadership of community. And finally, the millennial generation. Uh, the average age of the grad student, because millennials are adulting later, I have two millennial kids, they are definitely adulting later, um, they delay getting started, and older students uh, tend to be geographically less flexible. And so that means that when they choose to go back to graduate school, we're seeing the age of graduate education up and up, and particularly with fewer and fewer students uh, being able to move by the time they want to go to graduate school. Our program, LA, New York, currently Cincinnati, but in the future just LA and New York, so that's going to be a challenge. So what do we have to do, just in conclusion? Few key items to look at. Number one, we have to be strengthening student financial support. We have to go to a place where we're investing not only to cover tuition, but also to provide stipends and supplements so that we can begin to narrow the gap and so that the economic differential between becoming a rabbi and a servant to the Jewish people does not become so huge. Number two, we have to recognize that people are increasingly living longer lives. They're starting their lives later, adulting, and uh, they're living longer lives. They're able to engage in technology and build a low residence program so that like your cantor, you can be studying, but you don't have to move out of where you are. So if you're in North Dakota or you're in Seattle or you're in LA, you can study at HUC, online, bring people together on occasion a few times each year. We'd like to do it in Cincinnati and begin to build leadership no matter where people are. Number three, build out pipeline programs. Understand that that shrinkage of the confirmation class that I talked to you about, if we don't have, if the pools are shrinking, we need to repopulate and get into them through college and high school program. Um, number four, the bifurcation of ideas in our civil society, which is part of the fragmentation. We have to be in a seminary, the place where ideas are thriving, where we welcome people no matter what their views of Jewish theology are, politics, or identity, and use it as a sacred space to encourage those kinds of conversations. And finally, to the point that the uh, woman, thank you, the congregant raised just a moment, we need to re-examine our policies that restrict the number of students that come in if they are in interfaith relationships. We need to look at that carefully and soon and quickly because it's at a gap with our congregations and it could be a way to attract more students. So quite frankly, we're not gonna be successful and the future of American Judaism will not be successful unless we continue to be in a position of producing the kind of leaders that you have here at Stephen Wise Temple, dynamic, innovative, excited, people that understand that the job of a rabbi, of a cantor, of a Jewish clergy, clergy is to comfort people in times of sorrow, is to celebrate with them in times of joy. 
is to build communities of meaning and purpose based on our tradition and our texts and our practices, just like you've done here at Stephen Wise Temple. And it's for those reasons that I use this synagogue and so many like them in our reform movement as guideposts. What do we need to do to support you? Because so many of you have been so supportive of us. So with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your partnership and collaboration. And I look forward to working out these problems in the years ahead, growing, not just accepting the shrinkage, but growing as we figure out what are those microbes coming in that we're not even seeing, addressing those problems and building back even stronger. Shabbat Shalom, and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rayfield. Certainly food for thought. I, I would just add one other thing, and I've shared this with so many other people. It's my 32nd or 33rd year in the rabbinate. I can't think of anything I could have done that would be more satisfying. And I, I would like satisfying and meaningful and uh, as enthusiastic today as the day I entered rabbinic school. And uh, there's not a lot of professions that can give you that, but that's a whole topic for another discussion. Um, on page 258, I'll ask you to join me in a prayer for the United States. You'll find it at the bottom of the page. O guardian of life and liberty, may our nation always merit your protection. Teach us to give thanks for what we have by sharing it with those who are in need. Keep our eyes open to the wonders of creation and alert to the care of the earth. May we never be lazy in the work of peace. May we honor those who have died in defense of our ideals. Grant our leaders wisdom and forbearance. May they govern with justice and compassion. Help us all to appreciate one another and to respect the many ways we may serve you. May our homes be safe from affliction and strife and our country be sound in body and spirit. Amen. And if you'll join me at the bottom of 259, in a prayer for Medinat Yisrael, for the state of Israel. O Heavenly One, protector and redeemer of Israel, bless the state of Israel, which marks the dawning of hope for all who seek peace. Shield it beneath the wings of your love, spread over it the canopy of your peace. Send your light and truth to all who lead and advise, guiding them with your good counsel. Establish peace in the land and fullness of joy for all who dwell there. Together we say, Amen. Amen. Avinu sheba shamayim Tzur Yisrael v'goalo Barechet merinat Yisrael Reshit smichat keulatenu. Strengthen the hands of those who defend our holy land. Avinu sheba shamayim. Deliver them and crown their efforts with triumph. Bless our land with peace, O oh God, and its inhabitants with lasting joy. And let us say, let us say, Amen. Shamaim, Tzur Yisrael v'Kohalo, Arechet Merinat Yisrael, Reshit Smichat Geulatenu.
We have a very sweet custom here at Stephen Wise Temple. We call it Shehechianu moments just before we recite Kiddush together. And it's an opportunity for you to stand if something nice has happened in your life, if you have a simcha that you've just had or or looking forward to in the coming weeks or months. So I'll just invite any of you to rise who have some celebration of some sort, surely. Grandson is graduating next week. Mazal Tov. From where? From uh, uh, Marymount Manhattan College. It's a private school for actors. Very nice. It's going to be the next whatever on Broadway. The next whatever on Broadway, please. <laughs> Birthday. Birthday and Sheila? My grandson graduating Whitman College. Grandson graduating Whitman College. Terrific. And those of you who are online, we invite you to share your simcha in the chat. I'll bet you every single one of us, if we give some thought to it, has reasons for celebration. So I'll ask you all to please rise. And at the, on page five, you'll find our kiddush. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri HaGafen Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvot HaVerat Zavanu V'Shabbat Kodshu B'Ahava U'Bratzon Inchilanu Zikaron L'Maase V'Reishit Ki Hu Yom Techila L'Mikrai Kodesh Zechelitziyat <laughs> Continue on page 282 with our Aleinu. Aleinu l'shabeach l'adon hakol L'atheit gedula l'yotzer b'reishit Shelo asanu kegoye ha'aratzot Velo samanu kemishpechot ha'adama Shelo sam chelkeinu kahem Vegor aleinu kechol hamonam V'anachnu koreim Mishtachabim umodim, Lifne Melech, Malche Hamelachim, Akados Baruchu, Venemar, Haya Adonai, the Melech, Alkol Haaret, Bayom Hahu, Bayom Hahu, Hiya Adonai. You can be seated. Our prayer of memory, Kadisha Tom, can be found on page 294. And I'll invite anybody who is in a period of Shiva or Shloshim, the first seven or 30 days of mourning, to please rise. And those of you joining us from home, feel free to put the names of your loved ones in the chat. If you're in the first year of mourning the loss of a loved one, please rise. And if this Shabbat marks the yard site, the anniversary of the death of a loved one, please rise. And if it's your custom to stand in solidarity with the mourners, please stand now as we give thanks to God for the gift of life itself. Yit kadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah. Be'alma divra chirute v'amlich machute. B'chayechon uv'yomechon uv'chayed chol beit Yisrael b'agala uv'izman kariv v'imru amen. Yehe shmei rabah mevarach l'alam ulamei almaya. Yit barach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit romam v'yit nasei v'yit adar v'yit ale v'yit alal shmei v'kudesha b'richu l'eila min kol b'rchata v'shirata t'ushbechata v'nechemata Damiran biyama avim ru amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shamaya v'chayim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'im ru amen. Ose shalom b'mromav 
Uyase shalom aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. May the one who makes peace in the high places make peace for us here on earth, for us and all Israel and all humanity. We say together, amen. You can be seated. We're going to conclude with a setting that's based on last week's Torah portion. Why? Because Parshat Emor doesn't have quite as many musical settings. So we decided to go with Kiddoshim, which is the highlight of Leviticus. No offense to Leviticus. Not saying a lot because Leviticus is a tough book. But right at the heart of Leviticus, we are taught to be holy as God is holy. We are supposed to imitate all of God's attributes. I want to just, one of those attributes is gratitude. And so I want to say thank you to Josh Goldberg, our cantorial intern. And you're going to be a cantor in just a couple of, how long? One year. Oh, you have one more year. One year. It's just like tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. In, in, like in pandemic time, I lost track of the year. So I'll keep calling you cantorial intern. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank David Cohen and, of course, Jeffrey Stern. Rabbi Wisnika, thank you so much. And Dr. Rayfeld, thank you for being such a great friend of our congregation and being such an important leader for our movement. And Jessica, thank you for being here. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you all for joining us from home. We look forward to many, many more opportunities to celebrate. Next time you're in Los Angeles, those of you joining online, come on up here on Friday nights because we'd love to have you right here in the congregation with us. You shall be holy because God is holy and we are supposed to strive with all of our might to be like God in every way possible. God said to Moses, tell the people. God said to Moses, tell the world the right way to act, the kind way to give, the right way to think about how to live. And you shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be holy, I am your God. It's not for a reward, it's not the price of heaven. I created you to be like me, to make a better world. And you shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be holy, I am your God.
Shabbat Shalom, everybody.